So welcome to our uh, round, ta round table discussion in honor of Gagarin's um, orbital flight of 108 minutes 50 years ago. And we're going to have an introductory message from Professor Francisco uh, Sanchez, who is the director of the Institute of the Astrophysics Institute of the Canaries. He also founded the Institute and he is responsible for everything that you see around you. So, Francisco. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, welcome and thank you for your visit. In order to simplify the Garis translation, I read my speech in Spanish. Es para mí un honor y una alegría ejercer hoy aquí la obligación de anfitrión que tengo como fundador y director del Instituto de Astrofísica de Canarias de darles la bienvenida a nuestro Observatorio del Roque de los Muchachos y al Gran Telescopio Canarias. No es la primera vez que personalidades relevantes nos visitan. La inauguración de este observatorio estuvo presidida por los Reyes de España, la Familia Real Española, seis jefes de Estado y una representación importante de la comunidad científica internacional encabezada por cinco premios Nobel. Pero hoy esta mesa redonda de científicos, astronautas y artistas tan relevantes es algo muy, muy especial. Y resulta especialmente significativo que la tengamos bajo esta grandiosa catedral de la ciencia que es el, el GTC, el GTC, el mayor y más avanzado telescopio óptico infrarrojo del momento. Lo que aquí esta tarde se diga será una muestra de humanidad positiva y universalidad limpia, algo absolutamente necesario en este mundo convulso y amenazado en el que estamos viviendo y que tenemos la obligación de salvar para las generaciones futuras. En definitiva, esta mesa redonda es un soplo cósmico de esperanza para todos. Este lugar donde estamos es un muy buen sitio para una discusión de esta forma, por muy diversas razones. Yo hoy voy a señalar tan solo una, porque no hay tiempo para más. Están en una instalación científica española internacionalizada dedicada a profundizar en el conocimiento del cosmos. Es un observatorio netamente cooperativo, donde hay instrumentación de más de 60 instituciones científicas de 20 países. Es una reserva astronómica, además, protegida por ley para la explotación del recurso natural que es el cielo de Canarias para la astrofísica. Con demasiada frecuencia, la palabra cooperación suele encubrir la apropiación de algún recurso natural de países no desarrollados. Este no es el caso aquí, pues hemos conseguido que nuestros colegas de todo el mundo nos ayudasen a desarrollar la astrofísica en España, una rama de la ciencia que en nuestro país no se practicaba. En menos de 40 años hemos pasado de la nada a situarnos entre los 10 primeros países productores de publicaciones astrofísicas y uno de los poquísimos que han demostrado ser capaces de producir, casi en solitario, un telescopio como el que ahora nos cobija. Es algo que conviene no olvidar. Termino con dos palabras sobre la iniciativa Starlight, apadrinada por la Unión Astronómica Internacional, la UNESCO, la Organización Mundial del Turismo de Naciones Unidas. De forma sintética, les diré que esta iniciativa se expresa en acciones para proteger el cielo como patrimonio común de humanos, animales y plantas y se concreta en certificaciones que acreditan lugares de nuestro planeta como ventanas al universo, los observatorios profesionales, reservas Starlight, destinos turísticos Starlight y escenario y escenarios Starlight. Es todo. De nuevo, thank you for your visit. Welcome and when do you want? Okay. Uh, we've met um... Professor Sanchez and uh, Garik Israelian, and next to Garik is Neil Armstrong, and next to him is Alexei Leonov, and at the end of the table is Brian May, and on my left is Richard Dawkins, Jill Tarter, Jack Sostak, and George Smoot. 
And uh, before we start the roundtable discussion, um, Neil had a few words that he wanted to say. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, I am uh, delighted to be a, a part of this very distinguished panel. And I feel as though General Leonoff and I are a bit outgunned. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I wanted to talk just a, a bit about astronomy. I don't know as much about ast astronomy as any of the colleagues on the panel, so I will, I will take some license. Uh, people often ask me, what good is astronomy? And I tell them that uh, the, the first uh, measurements of significance were made without lenses by Tycho Brahe. And those measurements led his uh, assistant Johannes Kepler, to derive Kepler's laws. And Kepler's laws were used by Isaac Newton to devise, to, to devise Newton's laws. And Newton's laws were responsible for the Industrial Revolution and a complete change in the character of life as we know it. So astronomy does have inter very short-term impact on societal activities. Uh, 30 years ago, uh, I was on another island like this one. This island rises out of the Atlantic uh, about five kilometers above the, surf the surface of the ground below the water. And uh, 30 years ago, I was on a similar island uh, with uh, with rising out of water that was about five kilometers deep uh, in, in the Pacific. And I thought, uh, and on that occasion, I wanted to talk about the big picture. Now, in my world, the big picture is one thing. In, in, in this facility, my big world is teeny tiny. And, but I'm going to, I'm going to take excerpts from my lecture of 30 years ago and have the opportunity to be corrected by all the experts we have here on the panel today. So here we go, 30 years ago. Astronomers believe that they are beginning to understand the life cycle of the stars. Birth, growth, and death. And the inevitable consequence of such a life cycle is the eventual death of our sun, which among stars is now a virile adult, perhaps not yet middle-aged. And with its eventual demise, five to 10 billion years hence, the end of all life on Earth, a life that is, for all intents and purposes, completely dependent on the energy of the nuclear fire on Sol. Fortunately, we need not worry about the sun's death. Long before it becomes terminal, it will have metamorphosed in a, to a bloated red giant. It will boil away the Earth's uh, oceans, barbecuing the planet, and perhaps swallowing the carcass of our planet. And we need not concern ourselves with being engulfed in the red giant either, because eons earlier, another astronomical effect will have become very obvious. Our Earth's rotation is slowing. The friction of the ocean tides is said to be one of the causes of the lengthening of our day. Imperceptibly granted, but definitely. And eventually, the day will have stretched to weeks the weeks to months, and finally to a year where we will lock one face of Earth to the sun like the moon's front side is locked to Earth. The side toward the sun will sear, the opposite side will freeze, both will be uninhabitable, everyone will be moving to the edges. It's interesting to speculate on the activities of politicians, and real estate brokers as we approach that state. 
But phase lock is hardly an immediate problem either. A million generations may not make it appreciably closer. We can conjure a hundred reasons to require an earlier migration from Earth. Change in our atmosphere, overpopulation, radiation growth, other scenarios that would result in the extinction of mankind. Nuclear holocaust, epidemic disease, collision with a comet or, or asteroid. Uh, the last time that occurred, 65,000 years ago, according to a friend of mine and a colleague of Professor Smoots, Lily Alvarez, uh, certainly had effect on life on Earth. <clears throat> Amateur geologists among you will remember that the Earth's polarity changes from time to time. The north and south magnetic poles reverse positions. It hasn't happened for about 600,000 years, but there's some say there is evidence to indicate that another reversal is possible sometime soon. We don't have the foggiest idea of what the effect of such an event might be. I'm not prophesizing an apocalypse, uh, nor I do believe, do I believe that we should all be worrying about such catastrophes. But it does suggest there is some importance to the fact that we now know that the home of the human species is not necessarily restricted to Earth. The universe around us is both our challenge and perhaps our destiny. As Heraclitus said, if you do not expect it, you will not find it unexpected, for it is hard to find and difficult. Nevertheless, the unexpected will occur. Who can foresee what discoveries, inventions, and events will characterize the change ahead? We know a thousand times more about the universe around us now than we did just a quarter of a century ago. We can expect that increase of knowledge to continue, even without breakthroughs. It's possible that our future will occur, migrations of humans away from Earth, both to other natural planets and to man-made habitats. We will send probes to learn of the stars beyond our sun, for we have <clears throat> ample evidence that they are accompanied by planetary families. Our fascination is no longer with gold, but with life and the possibility that we are not the only creatures of reason in the universe. But if we are not only to survive, but to prevail, we must continue to improve. We must eventually rise beyond our differences and become true family of nations. We take great pride in our heritage and our principles, and property so. They have strengthened us, but they also imprison us. With our record here on Earth, we are not yet qualified to populate and govern a larger universe. We may or may not have time enough to grow enough as a species to control our ultimate destiny. Yet there's great reason for hope. And we have no other choice. There is no doubt that our instincts will force us to try. On reflecting on the same subject 200 odd centuries ago, another Greek Plato said, we must take the best and irrefutable of human doctrines and embark on that as if it were a raft on which to risk the voyage of life, which indeed it is, and indeed we must. Like that of Ulysses, each of our lives is a miniature odyssey, going new places, seeing new things, understanding new ideas, and each day penetrating the biggest unknown of all, tomorrow. For each of us, it should be, it can be, an exciting voyage. Bon voyage.
Thank you. Um, I would like to um, pose the first question to, to Neil and Alexi. Uh, coming out of something that came up yesterday, do you think that if we had pressed ahead, we could have had a permanent lunar colony by now? Was there, technologically, could we have done it by now? Not politically, but technologically. Start and then uh, Alexei can finish. Uh, we certainly have the technology, had we had the will and the resources to build, I, I can't say a permanent uh, colony, much as a permanent uh, research station, such as we have in Antarctica or something. That kind of facility could be existent today with the technologies we have and, and, and with the resources we have. Спасибо. На сегодняшний день мы можем легче осуществить наше путешествие на Луну и создать там определенные комплексы для нормальной жизни человека. Первое. У нас накоплен громадный опыт. У нас, я имею в виду, у человечества. Полеты на Луну, высадка на Луну, они так просто не прошли. Они оставили очень большой след и сделали большой задел на будущее. На посадки, начиная от нашего друга Нейла и заканчивая последним экипажем Джен, Юджином Серненом, Юджин Сернен, да. полеты российских автоматических, советских автоматических систем, два года работали тележки, луноходы управляемые с земли, которые передавали очень много информации. То количество грунта, которое было доставлено кораблями Аполло и кораблями типа Луна-17, они нам дают уже достаточное представление о Луне как о физическом теле и о возможности создания там вот этих лабораторий, о которых мы говорим. Мы имеем четко отработанные системы жизнеобеспечения. Например, станция «Мир» с системами жизнеобеспечения работали 14 лет. Мы получали воду, создавали пищу, меняли экипажи. Мы знаем, что один человек может непрерывно летать год без всяких изменений в организме. А космонавт Крикалев в общей сложности налетал 804 дня. Никаких последствий в изменении в организме, особенно в кровеносной системе, мы боялись, что будет что-то происходить с ретроцитами, они рождаются через каждые 9 месяцев, не произошло. Итак, технологией мы владеем, жизнеобеспечением мы владеем, как летать туда мы умеем. Значит, надо только лишь проявить определенную волю и не одной страны, а нескольким странам. Я думаю, тогда мы создадим на Луне подобную станцию, как сейчас мы находимся здесь, в обсерватории. Носители. Осталась без дела очень серьезная машина, энергия, которая выводила дважды груз на орбиту весом по 200 тонн. Больше мы ее не использовали, эту ракету, но ее в любой момент можно создать. Мы можем вернуться к ракете «Сатурн-5», которая являлась вообще идеальным носителем и может вывозить на орбиту тоже порядка 200 тонн. Итак, носители есть, корабли мы элементарно делаем, системы жизнеобеспечения есть, Экипажи есть. Мы готовы лететь на Луну. Thank you. Thanks very much. Now, now I'd uh, I'd like to uh, 
ask a more open question. Um, this was one of the things in the abstract of the program. Uh, why do we want to go to space? And be, before anyone else answers, I, I would like to put out there that I'm an astronomer today because of the space program in the 1960s. So, who wants to chime in? Brian, you're, um, you're about that vintage that you could have been inspired by, by the space program? I was totally inspired by this, the space program and I am totally in awe of being with these wonderful gentlemen, the astronauts, and, and I, I was astonished that uh, Neil said he felt outgunned. I think we all feel a little outgunned next to these heroes. It's, it's been a great privilege to share some space with them this last couple of days. Um, yes, I was totally inspired and I wanted to be a spaceman, really. And um, things didn't work out that way. I became a musician and an, an astronomer as well, uh, which is very fortunate for me. Um, and yes, I did want to go into space. Um, I think we're incredibly fortunate that the people who did go into space are the, the men that they are, men of conscience, men who care about the planet, who care about their fellow men, care about animals, the rest of the species with which we share our planet. What concerns me, and uh, yes, you picked on me because I, <laughs> I made this talk yesterday about why are we in space. What concerns me is what we take into space if the bulk of humanity follows these men. You know, at the moment, everything is good. Um, out there, but looking at the the awful mess that we've made of our beautiful, perfectly suited planet, um, I worry that that we should somehow have uh, some regulations in place so that we don't make the same kind of mistakes in the rest of the universe and become a plague in the universe as we seem to have become a plague on this planet. Thanks. George. So... I too was inspired by the uh, early space things, and particularly I was a child when Sputnik went up, and it uh, just focused my attention in, uh, in a way that was spectacular because everybody else was all panicked about it. And I thought, well, how wonderful, you know, it's neat, we're doing this thing. And I think one of the things that you see is children know that part of our future is in space. You know, they, they know it instinctively, they know it uh, that somehow the humans are going to get off the off the surface of the planet and go out. But you see everybody is, is actually inspired by astronomy and inspired by the space program. And so I have a couple things to say about that. When, when I occasionally I'm like Brian and I get depressed by how people aren't treating other people very well or the planet very well. And then I look and see that something like this is constructed, you know, where we have spent a fair amount of money to build an instrument to investigate the cosmos. And it's a program that's going to take decades, five years to build, you know, more years to commission, and then to improve and make observations with. But even more impressive is putting together the space program so the astronauts can go into space and orbit, build stations, go to the moon, build the, you know, moon base and moon colonies, perhaps go to Mars. Those are things you've seen huge masses of teams of people to be inspired to be involved in and do. And it actually shows you some of the best, the fact that mankind can do those things. And we have the advantage here of having some of the astronauts who got to be engaged in going to space. And sometimes they were originally motivated by national interests. But once they got the chance to go in space, be involved in this program, and they go in space and realize the implication of that, you see they get internationalized. It's not that they're just buddies because they're the only ones who went through it. They're buddies because they see the goal. They want to see man in space. They want to see mankind reaching out to the stars. And, and it's actually quite inspiring. Uh, you know, I, I give President John Kennedy a lot of credit for putting the goal of going to the moon, but I give all the countries and mankind credit for wanting to go to space. Well, Leslie, I have a particular reason for wanting to go to space, and that's when I was filling out um, aptitude tests as a young person and inspired by, by those gentlemen there, my goal was to be the first woman on the moon, and that goal hasn't been met yet. So I still think there are things to do. 
And any other any other yeah, comments? Yes, yes, yes yeah. Richard. Uh, so, uh, sorry. Um, uh, спасибо. Мы за эти 50 лет провели очень много собраний, встреч. Но такой встречи, как сегодня, на такой высоте мы проводим первый раз. За столом присутствуют ученые, присутствуют самые высокие специалисты, которые сделали не только каждый для своего отечества великие дела, но и для всего человечества. Это интересная идея, которая на сегодняшний день воплотилась уже в жизнь. Почти что полностью у нас завтра остался один праздничный день, чтобы подвести итоги нашего фестиваля. И я восхищен тем, что мы заканчиваем его вот необычном сооружении, которое является подвигом испанских ученых и испанского народа. Это уникальное сооружение. И то, что мы здесь находимся, это могли сделать только хорошие люди, обремененные ну, большими знаниями, интересами и желанием служить для большой международной науки. Но я бы хотел сейчас вернуться к тем 50-летиям, 12 апреля мы собрались по этому поводу. Молодой человек в возрасте 27 лет, Юрий Гагарин, облетел землю, посмотрел на нее. Я сейчас не буду говорить, по каким качествам его отобрали. Взглянув на здесь сидящего Нейла, других астронавтов, можно сказать, что это такие же люди с такой же судьбой, люди, которых выдвинуло время. Это очень важно. И время не ошиблось. Каждый из тех, кто слетал в космос, он решал сложнейшие задачи своей страны и человечества. Интересно, что этот парень, 27-летний, сделал свои первые слова, не подготовленные ни политиками, ни журналистами, но как они звучали и звучат, облетев землю на корабле «Спутники Восток», я увидел, как прекрасна наша голубая планета. И дальше люди, давайте хранить и приумножать красоту планеты, а не разрушать ее. Я повторяю ваши слова. Это парень который был увиденным, страшно обеспокоен. Что же мы делаем? Много проблем на Земле. Много мы решили проблем. И я считаю, что за эти 50 лет произошло самое главное в освоении космоса, что мы стали работать вместе. Это очень важно. Это очень важно. Я работал много с моими американскими коллегами. Я обращаюсь к своему другу Тому Стаффорду, как мой брат, мой браза, и Том меня также считает. Мы сейчас не понимаем, как мы можем работать по отдельности. Мы должны вместе работать. Я помню этот день, 12 апреля, был солнечный, яркий день на всей территории Советского Союза. У нас не было центра управления полета. Космонавты сами управляли этим полетом. И это пришел праздник на Землю. Праздник был не только для советских людей, а это праздник был праздник всех людей. И я очень рад, что решением Организации Объединенных Наций 12 апреля, день полета Гагарина, стало международным днем освоения космоса. Ведь это 
же здорово, и ни у кого не возникает сомнения. В Америке говорят, Гагарин – это не только ваш Гагарин, Гагарин – это наш. В Испании Гагарин – это наш. А я могу сказать, Нейл, то это мой. Тоже, так же. Это мой друг Артур. Это Билл Андерс тоже сам. Том Стаффорд. Вот что произошло самое главное. Но поскольку я сейчас взялся за микрофон, я бы хотел сказать вот к тем страшным сказкам, нет, к тому, что сказал Билл Ан, э, Нейл Армстронг, что нас ждет через миллиарды лет. У нас есть реальная, очень реальная опасность, связанная с астероидами. Э, вот то, что мы пережили Психоталинский, Аризонский, Тунгусский метеорит. Это на сегодняшний день очень опасно. И вот мне кажется, что мы, те, кто летал в космос, ученые, мы должны об этом говорить очень-очень настойчиво, приглашая правительства всех стран к объединению усилий против этой опасности. Это реальная опасность. И вы, как астрономы, вы больше, чем кто-либо это понимаете. Вот это. Пока у нас есть, уже проведен в Соединенных Штатах Америки эксперимент, когда ракета встречалась с метеоритом и выполнила свою работу. Есть носители, которые можно для этой цели использовать. Теперь надо наше... Трудно сказать, это не политическое решение, это решение умных людей, человечества. Вот на этой основе мы должны объединить свое усилие, а потом мы уже подсоединим всех остальных. Спасибо. An era of budget constraints. Um, how do we regard the uh, relative merits of manned and um, robotic missions? Um, do the robotic missions inspire people? Do they produce the same science? Do they produce poorer science, better science? Um, who wants to chime in? Uh, I, I think the. Uh on the one hand, it's been very disappointing that manned exploration has not really progressed in the last 40 years, but the contrast with what we've, what we've seen and learned from robotic exploration is amazing. I think it's incredibly inspiring. And I think it's the results from that robotic exploration that actually inspire us now to, to want to re-energize uh, human exploration. We have to have the right balance and I think there needs to be a lot of serious thought about how we can use better robotics to prepare the way for people to go back into space. It's, it's incredibly expensive, and we have to find cheaper ways of doing it, and that probably relies on advances in robotic technology. Arthur C. Clarke had a very nice phrase, the outward urge. And he, he likened uh, space travelers like the distinguished gentleman here to uh, explorers like Magellan and Columbus and Vasco da Gama. And I see that and I think it is very inspiring. But I do think that we have a responsibility as scientists to try to inspire young people to value science for its own sake. And therefore you don't actually need to send men, for example, to Mars um, if you can send uh, instruments or if you can build a telescope like the Hubble telescope or like this one that can fulfill that same outward urge um, and use resources in a way that actually yields greater scientific benefits than the, um, the admittedly inspiring exploits of men who actually go there. That is inspiring. But I think science is inspiring in its own right and uh, the exploration of the universe using gigantic telescopes, using the Hubble telescope, uh, and using robotics um, is also very inspiring, and we should urge young people to take up careers as physicists, as astronomers, 
as, as biologists and explore science. That should be the way our outward urge goes. I hate to be interrupting and adding things, but I have sort of a middle way here. <laughs> and that is, actually, if you look at what was possible up until now, you needed men in space. You needed men in space to fix the Hubble Space Telescope. You needed men in space for many things because people have, up until now, been much more versatile than robots. Now we're coming into a phase where we have many things where robots are doing things. We're in the transition, even in aircraft, where the pilot and the robot are actually sharing the roles. And so we're at a place where there have been situations where robots can quite well do the job of exploring the universe and the planets, and in fact, do it in a way that's safe without people. But there's still places where we need people, but the time is coming where we need people because we need it for the emotional aspect of humans. Right? The human beings have to connect in more than one way. They have to see that people are still moving outwards, this, this outward urge. There's, a, there's an outward urge of going and exploring, which you can do with robots, but there's an outward urge of actually having people going out and working in space or on the moon or in Mars and seeing that the human race is going to continue progressing. And I think you've got to have both of those. And it's a question of balance. And given the tight constraints, we, it's actually a real choice now. Before, it wasn't a real choice and we limped along. But if we hadn't had the Russians, we wouldn't have the space station now, right? We wouldn't have, if it wasn't the joint collaboration between the US and the Russians, we wouldn't have a manned presence possible in, the, in space at all. Yeah, I think, I think we have the best example is International Space Station which is actually working as a, as a hotel for space tourists and as a laboratory for scientists to go to do experiments. So this is perhaps the best example that we have both things and people to look for emotions, for something interesting, so they are ready to go there and to see the Earth. And in the meantime, we have scientists and cosmonauts going to work. So the, the example is here, right? Anyone else? I mean, the, the shuttle and the space station are pretty controversial, right? Because they've been so expensive. A lot of people think that's really drained all the possibilities out of more adventurous uh, ways of progressing. Yeah, but now we're building robotic telescopes that are every bit as expensive as what we've been in the past. We can, we can expand our budget to, uh, to any limit. I think, actually, Alexei had something else um, had a really good point. We don't have the dinosaurs because the dinosaurs didn't have a space program. Um, and Brian, I absolutely agree with you. We have to clean up our act here. But we either have to uh, get an absolutely fail-safe protective system against incoming rocks, or we've got to solve the single point failure of having the human population on one body in the solar system. I think that um, we, we probably do have to move off of this potentially um, catastrophic ending for humanity if we want humanity to, to last for a long time. Well, even though I'm not an astronomer I, at the same level that some, a couple of you are, but I mean, I do astronomy in a different form. There is actually a program that's been running the last four years to continue on, which is tracking all the asteroids, all the rocks in the solar system that people can find and track exactly to, to start getting an idea of what's going to happen. We know roughly this is going to happen every 100 million years. I mean, the last time was 65 million years. That doesn't mean it won't happen tomorrow, but it, it's, we think we can track things right now, so we know it's not going to happen right away. But we still need to prepare for this. I mean, but, but, but actually, we, we're starting to think about it. But dealing with a really big comet coming in is really a serious problem. Right? Particularly from the sunward direction, where you won't get it quickly, yeah. early. Yes, um, the Hayakataki, for example, came out of nowhere. And it was a 40-kilometer body. And that, that would have sterilized the surface of the Earth. Any, any additional comments? Ну, я бы сказал, одна из причин, почему 
мы, Советский Союз, не оказались на Луне, это наличие двух программ дорогостоящих, пилотируемые и беспилотные. И мы много потратили денег на беспилотную программу. Я уже сказал, две тележки бегали по Луне по 9 месяцев. А было бы хорошо, если бы там сидел маленький космонавтик и управлял этими тележками. Было бы очень правильно. Есть разумное сочетание. Я знаю, что если бы космонавты, астронавты не прилетали на Хаббл и не отремонтировали его, то Хаббла бы не было давно. Поэтому надо очень разумно на это смотреть. Никакой автомат не заменит человека. Должно быть сочетание. Прежде чем броситься в омут, надо бросить туда камень и узнать, глубоко или нет. Вот. А потом уже посылать туда человека. У Артура Кларка очень хорошо написано в Одиссее 2001 года, когда события проходят э, как в сан... э, на станции, где наподобие в Антарктиде живут вместе представители многих ученых, многих стран, и они летают на предприятия, которые ходят ожерельем вокруг этой торовой конструкции. Я вижу лично вот такую перспективу в этом. Так должно быть. Человек идет после автомата там, где невозможно быть ему и решает сложнейшие задачи, которые автомат не решит. Thank you. Uh, to follow on from that, and, and uh, this is particularly directed to, to Neil and Alexei, because you have had to make this choice, uh, where would we go next? W what targets would you consider worth risking your life to travel towards? I'll start. Uh, there are probably a lot of targets that have that value, uh, that are worth one human life. We do a lot of things on this planet that cost a lot more than one human life. Uh, so I, I, I don't think I can pick that, that individual thing. I can say that I, uh, I think there's a lot of merit in returning to the moon. We have visited six very small sites, uh, and I, I think there may be, I, I forget the number, maybe seven million hectares that we have missed. Or, uh, so there's a lot to be discovered there. Uh, but flying in the, in the vicinity of the Earth-Moon system is a relatively safe place from a radiation standpoint. And consequently, there's a lot of things we can learn in the Earth-Moon system that will qualify us to go further out in space more safely and reliably uh, while doing valuable things while we are there. And so I, I believe that uh, if we, if we uh, spent an enormous uh, amount of resources on uh, an early uh, flight to Mars, for example, which is certainly a desirable target to go to, but if we stubbed our toe somehow and, were, and failed in that, that, in that attempt, uh, our, our, our ability to go further might be permanently damaged. And consequently, I think we, there's, there's merit in, in establishing enough uh, quality in your, in your space flight operations that you can be sh quite certain that you can go further with uh, an equal uh, amount of productivity and safety. Okay. Uh, can, can I, can I, на сегодняшний день подписаны очень серьезные документы по работе станции МКС. И мы знаем, что станция будет работать до 2020 года, наращивая модули, выполняя научные эксперименты, достойные сегодняшнего времени. Там присутствуют, в общем-то, все ведущие страны мира. Китай сейчас заявил что они в ближайшее время запустят свою орбитальную станцию 
И вот сейчас во время заседания в ЮНЕСКО Ливей, китайский космонавт, официально пригласил все страны участвовать в работе китайской орбитальной станции. Это серьезное заявление, у них много очень денег, ну и слава богу, пусть они этим занимаются. Я думаю, нам до конца надо отработать на станции МКС, и сейчас надо думать уже о станции принципиально новой конструкции, и выдумывать не надо, Артур Кларк все это описал, как это должно быть, и что вокруг этой станции должны ходить предприятия типа Хабла, которые будут обслуживать ребята, брать то, что нужно, располагать, возвращать. Это вот ближайшая задачка. А я остаюсь при своем мнении, что все-таки надо думать о противоастероидном щите. Вот это э, задачка, которая должна объединить все человечество, все разумные силы, пометуя о том, что, ну только представить, если Тунгусский метеорит упал бы на любой город, пусть это Москва, пусть это Лондон, жизни бы там не было, это страшнее атомного оружия. Поэтому мы должны об этом очень серьезно думать. Thanks. Do, do any of the scientists have uh, wanted to chime in on uh, good targets? Well, I wanted to bring up an idea that's related to what Neil was saying. A, a really interesting scientific reason for going back to the moon, um, which uh, comes from my interest in how life got started on the early Earth. One of the big problems is we don't know very much, we don't have direct evidence of the environment on the early Earth. But we know that there are rocks that were ejected from the early Earth by impacts that are there on the moon. And if there was a research station and there were people and real geologists walking around and exploring, we might be able to find some of those and, and give us information that would be very, very hard to get any other way. So that's one of the things, a very practical scientific thing that makes me very excited about the possibility of going back to the moon. Can I just say I'm, um, having been pessimistic about some things, I'm, I'm very excited about the idea of having a, an astronomical observatory on the moon. I mean, uh, something like this, something like the GTC on the moon would be a colossal thing. And of course you don't have so many problems with uh, gravity, you certainly don't have any problems of atmosphere. I mean, that's got to be one of the most exciting things you can think about. And I would like to see men there. I, would, I think it's a shame if we could only see that on TV. And I would trust astronomers to be on the moon. I'm not sure I would trust anybody else, but I would trust astronomers. The astronomers uh, are worried about the dust on the moon for a, a piece of equipment like this. I'm also a bit pessimistic about this because it's obvious that we cannot go to very powerful projects like flying to Mars and again another, unless we have another political leader, a very strong one, who will be basically doing the same thing as Kennedy did. And do you really think that we are going to have a leader ready to take this step and say we are going to Mars? Do you think we will have a leader like that? So uh, I think a, a related uh, aspect of, uh, of that is that at the moment, as you said, we don't have the will or the resources to do it. And going to what Brian's been talking about, maybe we won't be able to do it until we do clean up our act here. If military budgets were reduced by half, we would have the resources to do so much, not only for our planet, but also to really do serious exploration of our solar system and beyond. I think it's going to be a long time before you have a politician in charge of any country who puts astronomy before their military aspirations, sadly. Yes, I would have to agree with that, at least in the current state. Um, in fact, I. Uh, the, the telescope on the moon, um, I wanted to ask you about that, Neil, because um, 
when Jim was showing the, the, the little movie yesterday, something that struck me that I hadn't focused on when I was 10, 12 years old and watching this live is just how covered the suits were in the dust. Um, how, uh, how big an issue do you think the, uh, the dust would be for a telescope on the moon? It'd certainly be a consideration. The question is, uh, could you find a, a, a solution for that problem? And my instincts tell me that given, given a little brain power and attention, uh, a, a, an acceptable solution could be determined. Uh, insofar as those white suits, uh, perhaps uh, when we do build this equivalent of this, of this wonderful facility uh, on Luna, all the staff will wear charcoal gray suits. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I had a conversation with an um, uh, astronomer a few weeks ago, and we talked about whether astronomy is, at least ground-based, is reaching the, the end of days. Um, are we uh, reaching the point where we cannot really conceive of building more powerful telescopes than what are on the drawing boards now. So, um, Jill, do you want to chime in on that? Yeah, I, I think that that's uh, nonsense because I think we're going to continue to build powerful computers, which are actually becoming the largest part of our instruments today. I think that's Moore's law is going to allow us to continue to explore. And I think there are no end to questions so I think that uh, to the extent that it's becoming silicon rather than, than steel and aluminum um, that gives us the next advances, we're still going. I would agree with that um, with regard to radio telescopes, but what about the optical telescopes? Isn't there also the growing uh, desire to look at more and more targets almost continuously? to see uh, events that happen on a short time scale. I think we will want to have more and more and more telescopes, not necessarily bigger, but more. And Leslie, with the optical telescopes, I mean, it's again, it's the same kind of thing, the adaptive optics, right, which are, are allowing us to open up new um, possibilities from ground-based. And I agree with Jack, a lot of really well-instrumented smaller telescopes would go a long way. I think there's a lot of room for improvements. You know, I talked about that we're that we're in the process of now doing. We've gone from the million galaxy survey and went in the process of five million, and we want to go to 50. Then we're going to want to go to 500 million. I mean, there's 100 billion galaxies. It's a long time, even with Moore's law, to to get to all of them. So there is that. But I, I want to go back because I think Alexi is the one who's actually identified a problem that I've been concerned about, but it may be because both of us knew Luis Alvarez and saw the formation with, with the, the four of them, the formation of the fact that the death came to the dinosaurs, you know, from the skies, not from, you know, smoking or, <laughs> or air pollution or some other effect, you know, but uh, that there is something that is a common goal to everyone on the earth. And if people are educated and they understand that there are going to be these asteroids coming in and, and hitting the Earth, and that we got to be tracking them now. We got to be thinking about what will we do for planetary defenses and how will we take care of that. If something, you know, when people become aware of that, I think that you could actually have an international effort to have that part of the space program go, and that will interest people more into running the International Space Station equivalent, whatever the next generation is going to be. That's how you get people to go back, it's not gonna come from a strong leader, though you could hope China or India or some country is gonna come up and be bold and strong and actually have a good leader, right? I mean, Europe has not formed into a single body and therefore there's no single leader can do that. And, but, you know, Brazil might be that way someday, but here's something you can start and it's something that's necessary to start thinking about this problem. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a real issue it's a kind of a problem you'd want to have the equivalent of the UN, but for, for space, 
to be dealing with. And, and so I, I agree with Alexi. I don't know if it's because we both knew Louis and we both paid attention to the, to the you know, asteroid killing the dinosaurs, but it's a real issue. It's equivalent to a military spending, isn't it? I mean, you could, <clears throat> you could spin it as, the, as though it was a military program, but with the asteroids being the enemy. Don't give them any more excuse to militarize space, please. Oh, no. <laughs> I just want to throw in again, do we really, are we really only concerned with the, the survival of mankind? Because we don't seem to be doing very well about the survival of all the other creatures who, together with us, inherited our planet. I, I can't believe that we turn such a blind eye to this. And, uh, you know, there may, there may soon be no wild animals left. And... Um, and maybe human beings will colonize the whole universe, but didn't something get lost along the way? Well, it's also true, of course, that when the dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago, that opened the way for the mammals to rise, and the mammals stepped into the shoes that were left when the dinosaurs disappeared. And so um, you could take a very, very long view and wonder what would come next. I want to we, say Brian. Sorry, we killed off the rest of the mammals. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, <laughs> Brian, be more optimistic. What you've got to do if you want people to be great and noble, give them a great and noble goal. Give them things they can do that in their self-interest and brings out the best in them. You know, and if it's a simple thing like protecting yourself from dying, that's that that's a good start because they'll focus on doing the right thing, right? So y you shouldn't spend your time telling them they're bad because they're killing people, you should say, look, you're doing great here. Well, that, um, there's a lot of uh, discussion of international collaborations, and um, Jill and I were talking about this earlier. The, the, the rule of thumb is that uh, as soon as you get an international collaboration, you boost the price of the project by at least 50%. Uh, are there ways that we can try and get around that tax? Hmm, <laughs> that, that doesn't look good. <laughs> so, so I didn't know that tax this, was there. <laughs> I have a, a small group. We don't actually have any international collaborations, but what we do have and what makes a huge difference is people coming from all over the world. Right? There's students and postdocs from many different countries who have come to my lab and many similar labs. And... Uh, that's really, really important for at all kinds of levels, right? For advancing science, for spreading ideas, spreading cooperation. You know, it's, I think it's not, I don't know if that adds 50%, but it, it certainly is worth the price. I would, oh, excuse me, I, I would add that uh, this wonderful facility where we, so, uh, hosts, astronomers from the world over for its use. I don't know how much more it costs to have uh, individual nations participate in here together, but I think whatever it costs, it's worth it. Uh, and uh, it may indeed cost more to, as you say, to have, have pay a tax. Uh, but uh, that's a tax we probably should be willing to pay. She, we should also be willing to try to find ways to minimize it, but I don't think we should allow individual to, to uh, degrade the quality of inter international collaboration in science. I agree with that. And uh, we talked earlier about the inspirational value of sending men into space. Uh, and I think there's also an inspirational value in having international cooperation. When I visit a facility like this or when I visited CERN, the At Atomic Energy Establishment in Geneva, near, near, near Geneva, I was moved almost literally to tears by the thought that this gigantic enterprise was bringing together people from all over the world, speaking different languages, in a common enterprise of solving some of the deepest questions in all of science. And if there is a, an extra financial cost to that, I I think I agree with Neil that it's probably worth it. I agree. Can I chip in? I, we are in a great place here because of Garrick Israelian 
we're all sitting here, and this is called the Starmus Festival. It's about reaching for the stars, and it, it's about music as well. And there are two great things in the world which cross all international barriers. One is pure science, and the other is pure art, and especially music. Maybe I'm biased, but uh, music has a great capacity to just cross every barrier. And and let's have more let's have more music, and let's have more more pure science, and more festivals like this. Leslie, I think there's um, a potential tax in international collaborations that we're n that's beyond financial, and that's I am concerned when we have multinational collaborations to build a facility that then only scientists from those countries can use. I mean, I think we really do need to. Um, champion the open skies policy that even if certain nations built the equipment that the best science should be done with those instruments no matter where the scientists come from yeah i absolutely agree with jill it's a serious problem that we are facing all astronomers that we don't have open access to most of the powerful facilities in the world so astronomers from russia or from other countries they cannot apply for a keck time cannot get to, you may have a brilliant idea but there is no way that you can do your observations with keck there are ways to to avoid or to start collaboration etc but but they are not very simple it's not an easy thing so the basic the, the, the message is that the, the, the this the, the path is much more easy if you are from that country is 100 times, 1,000 of times, thousands of times is easier. And, and this is something which really goes against uh, scientific progress. So George, um, being part of a lot of international collaborations, um, what's your perspective on this? Do you see uh, both value, uh, uh, I think it's without doubt that there's value for the international groups, but are, are there obvious excesses that can be? There, there are great benefits and there are great costs. And so we talked about the inspirational aspects of many people working together. You know, sir, I left CERN out before, but the space program, these big astronomical other things, all these, there are big science projects that go on to do that. Now, one of the things that I do which the astronauts will understand, as I have done a number of satellite pro projects, a number of other big collaborations, where there are big projects where you have to have programs, and you almost always have to have international collaborations because that's the only way you can both get the talent and the resources you need. So one of the things you, you can't, there's no country now that has enough talent, scientific talent in this country to solve some of the big issue problems. You have to get it. Now, you may be a small group, but you import, you know, postdocs or grad students from China or from India or, or from the Soviet Union or from Europe or from wherever, right? And and uh, you, because you got to get the best talent because they're the only ones going to attack the problem. But sometimes you have to have more resources. There are extra costs. When you run a big project that has a certain time schedule and you, you're coordinating people together, you always have to carry contingency. So it's well known in the space program. You carry a contingency for technology, for schedule, for problems that come up. When you have an international collaboration, you also carry a political contingency. It's, it's because there are different systems, both political systems and just the way people operate and the funding cycles they're on, there is an extra risk, an extra contingency. And you just have to factor that in. And that's an extra cost, but there's some problems you can't tackle without a huge international group. That, you know, you couldn't build CERN, you couldn't build, you know, the equivalent of the next generation space telescope. You can't, you couldn't go to the moon again without a large collaboration, right? Or to be a fortunate, up and coming rich country, you know, China or Brazil might might have that capability in the future, but we don't know. That's so that's the way the world is, but in some ways it's good because the world needs to learn to collaborate because we have real problems that are international problems. Okay, thanks. Um, I'd like to uh, move on to considerations of things that are might might be a bit more controversial. Um, 
we, we know there are many planets out there. We suspect that there are planets around essentially every star. Um, inevitably, there are going to be lots of planets in habitable zones, and um, the issue of life is out there. Um, so I'm posing this question first to Richard. Uh, do you think that, uh, that extraterrestrial civilizations will have religions? <laughs> well, yeah, I was afraid something like that would come up. Um, experience on this planet suggests that uh, no matter what evidence you present to people, um, they will resort to supernatural explanations if uh, there happens to be a gap in the natural ones that are available. Um, I regard supernatural explanations as intellectual cowardice, um, evading the responsibility which we have as scientists and as humans to really try to understand. To say that something is supernatural is caused by a god or gods or pixies or fairies or, or ghosts or spooks is equivalent simply to saying, I don't know. But it's worse than that, it's also I don't care. It's I do, I'm not even interested in finding out the answer. It's an admission of defeat, it's lying down under the problem and refusing to face up to it. Of course I can't speculate about whether other civilizations, if there are any, and I believe there are, will have religions. I think their psychology may be so different. I suspect that there is a a religious urge in many people which is not directly favored by natural selection, but I suspect that natural selection has favored brains that have certain predispositions which can become religious under the right cultural circumstances. And that's a very human thing, and I wouldn't wish to speculate about uh, other, other civilizations. It's a different question whether the discovery that there is lots and lots of life all over the universe would give any pause to religious people on this planet, reflecting that perhaps um, their preoccupations deriving from earlier centuries are a bit parochial, a bit uh, small, a bit petty, uh, when compared with the, the sheer scale of the universe. I mean, my belief, I'm not a religious person, but I'm sort of spiritual in the sense that I believe um, I get a great sense of, of wonder, a great sense of, of, of spiritual upwelling when I contemplate the Milky Way uh, and when I contemplate um, some of George Smoot's galaxies. Um, but, what, but what I see is nothing remotely supernatural. What, what I see there is a challenge to the future and I believe that the science of the future will uncover wonders which will outgun any of the petty parochial things that theologians have ever managed to come up with. Jill, you've probably given this um, question some thought. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm so entirely comfortable with what Richard has just said. And uh, on, on bad days, when things are not going very well, in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, I wake up and say, well, gee, you know, the problem is that they invented organized religion as well. And they <laughs> did themselves in as a result. Um, so I, I think about, I, I wonder if, um, you know, some of the wonderful writings uh, that, that uh, Richard has, has given us, um, the human individual, and the way our brain works and our predilection for the supernatural or the religious uh, tendencies. I wonder if somewhere else life were um, more of a col colony kind of thing, if it weren't an individual organism, but, uh, but like organisms. Ants. Hmm? Like ants. Like ants, yeah. If, if the, the religious urge would be there, I, I don't know. Can I jump in a little bit? I kind of don't feel comfortable with Richard's view because I think you have to draw a distinction between organized religion and is there a God? I mean, I don't actually subscribe to any organized religions, but I don't think that scientists 
are any more qualified to answer the question of is there a God or not than anybody else. I think science is fantastic at answering all sorts of questions about how things work, but you ask a scientist why some things work, they have no answers. I don't think we have any answers. I think these questions are completely outside the domain of science. Apply to that. The uh, Duke of Edinburgh was once in the audience when the physical chemist Peter Atkins was uh, speaking, and the, the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip, said, well, it's all very well. You scientists can solve the how questions, but what about the why questions? And, Prince, and Peter Atkins said, sir, the why question is just a silly question. There is no such thing as a why question. Why should there be a why question? We have science which can answer the question why in the sense of how did the, phys the forces of physics give rise to the world, the universe that, that we have. What more do you want in the way of a why question? If you want something like what is the purpose of the universe, it's no more meaningful than what is the purpose of a mountain or a river. It doesn't have a purpose. It's a human weakness to want to see purpose to want to see why questions in, in everything. I must be a very weak human being. <laughs> I want to know why. Well, actually, yeah, you made me um, unhappy with that because I often tell young children that one of the best things about being a scientist is that they never have to stop, they never have to grow up and stop asking why. Yes, but that's why in the scientific sense of what are the antecedent conditions that give rise to the observations you're, you're seeing. It's not why in the sense of what's the purpose of it all. So I also completely uh, going along with, with uh, Richard's uh, statements, and I'd just like to say that although I don't think the universe as a whole or physical parts of it have a purpose, we can look within ourselves. We have to for our own purpose. That's where you find purpose inside yourself. Absolutely right. But uh, I think we can partially resolve the conflict if we define God as a nature. Partially. That would be a nice way of getting rid of him. <laughs> um, so when I ended my talk um, the other day, I, it was, uh, I, I said that sometime in the next couple of years, Kepler will find an Earth-like planet in an Earth-like orbit around a Sun-like star. And, and I said that I hoped that um, that would help bring humanity together. Um, what do you people think of the chances of that? Um, you know, I, I, I have to admit to um, living in Washington, being bombarded with the uh, the negative environment, political environment there, uh, has somewhat made me skeptical. Let me let the level of conversation down because I was afraid Richard was going to be explaining to Brian that the, the beings on other planets were even worse than humans. <laughs> and, but but anyway, we'll go back to that. So two weeks ago, I was teaching in my, sort of near the end of my course about exoplanets. So I've looked at the data recently just to see what Kepler had said. Now, Kepler is all tentative right now because they like to see everything three times. But you can sort of extrapolate based on statistics what you think the answer is. And when I plug the numbers in, I would estimate from what they found. They found some Earth-like planets. Now the question is exactly where they are and how it goes. If you just look at the numbers, somewhere around 1% of the stars in our galaxy have Earth-like planets in the habitable zone. Now there are a lot of stars that are smaller than our sun, that is they're less bright, so they get to be closer. Kepler sees more of those because they orbit more quickly. And, and so, just think about that. That's on the scale of two or four billion planets that are in the habitable zone. And I would say there's a reasonable chance, although I can't give you a good confidence interval because I haven't studied it carefully, but that they have water on them. They have, you know, it's extremely likely there'll be water on them. So if life is at all, you know, if Jack is right, that life has got a reasonable chance of arising, that life is going to be on a lot of planets, right? And the question is, are they going to develop into 
to you know advance civilizations that are bad to the other animals, right? I don't know, <laughs> or have religions or whatever. That that's a little harder to estimate, but you got a lot of chances. In our own galaxy, you got four billion of those, and you got a hundred billion galaxies, right? So you got two factors of a billion. There's just a lot of chances out there. It's hard not to believe that there's going to be some advanced societies, you know, even maybe close to us, right? I mean, that's, that's hard to say. But what do you mean by close, right? The answer is it takes light at least thousands of years to get to us, right? It would take us a really long time to get there. So, you know, every now and then, young people are terrified about where we're trashing the planet, and they're hoping we're going to find an Earth-like planet so they can go and live there. That's, you know, we got a ways to go. You know, that's a real space program <laughs> to be able to transport colonists to a habitable planet. But that's a worthy goal for the long term, right? But, but we can see. But what I think is, Brian, you shouldn't worry too much. Humans are not going to colonize all of space. Not, not in any foreseeable future, not even in the lifetime of our galaxy. We might get a big fraction of the galaxy if we worked really hard. <laughs> but everybody's got to get behind it, right? <laughs> but we're not going to go out and, and inhabit all the galaxies. It's just not going to happen. So, you know, the universe is self-protecting. Yeah, there's a, there's a very, very small um, cage around us, isn't there? There, there? there are not many places we can get during our lifetime or anybody else's. So yes, we're talking about a, a, a very small circle of, of possible influence of, the human be of human beings, really, in the foreseeable future, yeah. I, I was really asking about the, um, the psychological impact of the discovery of an Earth-like planet. Is, does anyone think that that might actually um, give humanity the kick in the pants that it seems to need right now to, to start thinking as a planet, as a single race. Have you seen Avatar? <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> well, uh, I have a Did terrible feeling. true. <laughs> I have a terrible feeling the answer might be in there. Well, I certainly do, Leslie. You know, I, I talk about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence as something that allows us to hold up a mirror and reflect the Earth as being all the same. The same exact kind of message that um, the early, uh, that, our, that our space program gave us when we could look back and not see the boundaries, not see nation states, just see a fragile blue dot in a black expanse. Um, I think the more that we engage the public with conversations that stretch them to adopt this more cosmic perspective. And showing them other Earths is one part of that journey. I think it, uh, it at least prepares the mind for having a, a, better, uh, a better feeling about other Earthlings. Anyone else want to weigh in? Yeah, Chad. You know, I, I think it'll help, but what I, um, I don't think it'll make a huge difference, but what I, I certainly hope is that it will at least inspire people to want to have a closer look at those places, to actually build the instruments that we need to, uh, to, to get information about whether there might be life there, to, to, to look at the chemistry of the atmospheres of those Earth-like planets, ultimately maybe even to, to image them. That would be fantastic. Yeah, I think what, what Kepler will do is not just find um, additional Earth or Earth analogs, but Kepler will give us the statistics that will tell us how big we have to build sure. the next terrestrial planet finder, life finder, um, in order to have a good chance of finding a nearby terrestrial planet that we can study like that. Actually, along those lines, it it actually already has inspired new programs where people are developing small, small telescopes, nanosats, to look continuously at every nearby star. And, and um, you know, that's just going to grow exponentially as we start to find things that are closer. 
Yes, indeed. Um, I, I just heard about uh, one of these projects, and the first nanosats are going to be launched in December of this year. There we go, trash in the space again. <laughs> um, so, many of us have been in the position of, of uh, educators and, and trying to inspire kids to go into science and engineering as a career. Uh, what have each of you found that, that works for you and, and reaches, um, reaches across boundaries um, the best to, and how early do you need to catch the kids and suck them in? Um, for me, you know, it, it was, it hit me about eight years old and it was the space program and Star Trek. And um, it hit at that critical time and, um, and I never looked back. Yeah, absolutely. I think I was hit by Solaris when I was already teenage, quite late. And um, I totally agree with you. I think science fiction is basically the, the best way to, to get kids into astronomy and science. And I, I, I'm pretty sure that astronomy is the, perhaps is the only science which has this very open, very wide gate to getting lots of kids. And later on, let them choose becoming, I don't know, biologists or whatever they want to become. But astronomy is really the, the perhaps the only science which you can capture when you are very young, or six years old, even five years old. No, dinosaurs are pretty cool, too, for, for <laughs> young kids, and creepy crawly things. Um, they're also good capture mechanisms. But I think, yeah, I, I think third grade is, uh, at least there have been some studies that indicate for, for girls, um, you want to catch them by third grade before they start to lose self-confidence. Could, could I say something on behalf of biology? Um, the fact that a process that we now understand, namely evolution by natural selection, has taken a dry, life, a wet rather, lifeless planet and built in it objects of such stunning, astounding complexity as animals, especially us with our brains that are actually capable of understanding it is a most shattering thing to reflect upon. And it's saddening to me that so many children just take it for granted and don't realize what a truly wondrous fact their own existence is. And it's nice to reflect upon how, how many times this may have been duplicated ar around the universe, of course. Um, just let me add one thing, ju only just occurred to me today, an educational opportunity offered by um, people in space. Um, I was just thinking about weightlessness and talking to our astronaut friends about what it's like to be weightless. And it occurred to me that um, if only we had all been weightless from the start, Newton's laws would have been discovered much, much earlier. I mean, we are hampered by gravity. Um, it's counterintuitive that if you propel an object uh, it'll just go on forever unless there's some force to to uh, slow it down. Um, and I, I was reminded of a lovely quotation from Douglas Adams, one of my favorite authors, who said, the fact that we live at the bottom of a deep gravity well on the surface of a, a, a gas-covered planet uh, going around a nuclear fireball 90 million miles away and consider that state of affairs to be normal shows how warped our perspective is. Our perspective is warped by the fact that we live on the bottom of a gravity well. And um, there may be other limitations to our understanding which, may, which could be expanded by um, the thought of, or indeed the actuality, of going into space. We'd float away though, wouldn't we, without gravity? Oh, sure, yeah. Sorry, I'm being facetious. <laughs> I got to say, you know, one of the things we can do, surely, is clean up the skies, because millions of kids now grow up never having seen any stars to speak of. I mean, certainly millions never see the Milky Way. I, I meet lots of them, and um, I think the first thing you can do is take them to some place where they can see the stars, show them a couple of planets through a telescope, and most kids absolutely 
their eyes widen, their jaws drop, and they're hooked. Right? That's what I find. So, Jack, um, are you able to inspire people with your approach to biology? I mean, the, the, that's fascinating to me. Um, do you go out to uh, your kids' schools, for example, and, and talk, to, talk to children? I, I know I've done that myself, uh, my son's school. Yeah, I've, I've done um, things like that. And I, I think it's, you know, you, you can get small groups of, of kids excited by doing that. I think it, it's, a, it's a harder and maybe more important challenge to think about how to scale that up, right? Because just inspiring one classroom, I mean, that's nice, but it doesn't have a really global impact. Uh, so I think we need to be really creative about how to expand this. And certainly, I think, you know, uh, having a, a really simple but uh, important question that everyone can relate to, you know, how did we get here, right? How did life start? Or how did the universe start? Th those kinds of questions can really grab people. Yeah. So I, I think that, that's a, a helpful uh, approach. So let me continue on, because I had the same experience that Jack had, going out to schools and, and talking to kids, and they get excited about it, and you have this interaction with them for a while, and that's good, but you're, it's just so, you can't do your work and go to, to do that. We have a set of people who are supposed to do that. They're called teachers, and the problem is many of them don't have a science background, and they actually are afraid to teach science to kids, and that's how we lose a lot of kids. So. I learned if, if, what you want to do is franchise. You know, I learned from McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken. You want to franchise. So you'll see two weeks I'm running a teacher, uh, two weeks teacher workshop to train teachers how to teach about using, you know, astrophysics and cosmology and questions like where does life come from, how to teach that to their students, provide them materials, give them advanced lectures. One of the things that excites teachers and excite students is when they have access to frontline research, up-to-date re up research. People can tell what's new, right? And now kids can get on the web and they can, they, they, they can be knowing as much as the teachers. And so what you want to do is think about the people who are going to be in contact with the students hours after hours, right? You inspire them by what they see on TV and TV shows. They see the, you know, the, a satellite launch or some great discovery but the teacher is the one that they get to interact with and so forth. You have to inspire the teachers, so we're trying to figure a way to teach teachers and then have teachers teach a new generation of teachers after that. So you have a cascading program. But that, it's difficult because the education system resists change. <laughs> Actually, one of the, one of the, the things that, that we work on at the SETI Institute is, is exactly that, teaching teachers. And we've taken um, the SOFIA infrared telescope on a 747 and we have a program to fly teachers to get them involved in the um, the process of science and uh, developing observing programs and working with the scientists to collect the data and then they they take that back to the classroom and build uh, curriculum on it and and so I think to the extent that we can involve teachers in research with us in the summers it's a really good Thing because it, you're right, it has right. this wonderful spreading. And you're, what you're saying is exactly right. The teachers have to feel they're part of the science process, not bucket handlers handling, you know, giving a little training to one of our bright students and handing them on. And it's not, you're, you're, you're not just trying to get scientists, you're trying to get engineers, you're trying to get technical people, you're also trying to get a broad education to the public so they understand what's going on. But the teachers want to feel that they're part of the whole enterprise and, and they're on the front line. Right? In the, um, in the U.S. now, we have uh, a problem that is often posed in a way that grates on me, that um, 40 or 50 percent of people don't believe in evolution. I hate I have seen um, a, a rise of um, conservative religiosity around the world, and, uh, and it, it has caused me to wonder whether this is the result of um, a very rapidly changing world in which people 
are trying to hold on to some simple idea to to resist that change that's swirling around them. Does anyone have thoughts on that? Okay, I'm I'm adding. This is real speculation, though. Other stuff I actually had thought about. This is <laughs> this is wild speculation, which is I believe that a lot of the you know, what you see is conservatives. You, you say religiosity. I think you should be more careful. It's the people who are going to be more fundamental or charismatic. They're, 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 they think they're hearkening back to the way they thought it was when things were better. Just, and many people are doing that in other ways. And the world is changing, and it's changing faster and faster. And it's scientists' fault because we're discovering more things which make new technologies, which enable even more technologies. So things are growing exponentially. And society has difficulty adjusting to that. And so people wish that it was beautiful and stable the way it was before. But I had my cell phone in my refrigerator too, right? I mean, I, I want all that. And so you have to let people know that they're empowered, right? And that you're not really trying to threaten, threaten their release, you know, belief base. You're just trying to move things forward, and yes, there are going to be adjustments. Right? That, that's what's going to happen. And you're, you're, if you get antagonistic, you're going to have, you're going to fight. Right? And what you need to be thinking about is there are lateral ways to educate and inform people and show them there's a broader horizon, and then let them make their own paths. So, Brian, when when you're composing. When you're composing songs, do you, do you ever think about um, a, a message, or uh, is it? Um, uh, do you are you? Is your primary concern entertainment? Uh, I, I'm just curious about that in, in respect to this particular question. Uh, okay, you hit me <laughs> in an unusual place. Um, I think of music as a as a means of communication, really, and a very subtle way of communication, communication of emotions and things which words are some, sometimes not very good at doing. Um, so most of my, even though I'm an astronomer, most of the things that I write are, are, are about very simple things, relationships, feelings, um, and uh, the way we relate to to each other rather than the cosmos. I did actually write a song which was based around general rel relativity, really. It's called 39, and a lot of people know this song. It's, it, it's built like a folk song, but basically it's about astronauts who go away um, at a speed close to light and come back what they think is a year later, but in fact, to the people on Earth, it's 100 years later. And it's a, But what intrigued me was not so much the science, but the human element that the, the astronaut steps off his, his space rocket and what he sees he perhaps thinks is his wife but it's probably not his wife it's probably his daughter or his, or his granddaughter so I was intrigued by that um, but on the whole I'm, I'm interested by human beings and the way they feel and the way they react and the way they love and the way they they grieve and the, the way that they, they empathise Back to what George was, was saying, um, it's an interesting thought that people feel insecure and frightened because technology is racing ahead and that makes them into the 40% who, who, who don't accept um, ev evolution. But actually, I've noticed that some of the worst offenders among the 40, actually it's more like 45%, are, are techies. They're people who love computers and love gadgets and, and they're, they're very often trained engineers which is shocking to me. Um, so it, 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 it occurs to me that, in, in this, it's, that evolution's a very special case. They don't seem to be against relativity or, or quantum mechanics or anything. Climate change. Oh, climate change, that's another one. That's, that's very interesting. That's very true. But so we have an uphill struggle with our science education because we have to combat not just indifference and boredom and apathy and ignorance, in, in my subject of evolution, we actually have to contend with active opposition, active opposition to science from organized, well-financed, tax-free, well-financed uh, religious opposition. Um, well, I, I would 
suggest that you check out Conservapedia if you think that some other aspects of science are not under attack. Um, that, that is a very scary website. Um, relativity comes in for a particular attack on, on there. <laughs> Does anyone else want to throw, um, throw a question out to the panel? We've, we've got about 10 minutes left. I'm concerned that we haven't heard from our astronauts for a little while. And may I pose the question, how they feel about the universe and spirituality and God? I've only seen a small part of it, uh, uh, and I'm not very well qualified to make judgments yet. I do think uh, there's, a, there's an enormous interest in, sci in society as a whole in whether or not we are alone. Is that better? Okay. Uh, enormous interest by everyone of whether we are alone. And uh, it's one of those questions that only has two answers. It's yes or no. Either one is equally remarkable to various sectors of society. Uh, I think uh, Statistically, uh, the evidence is is so very strong, as has been pointed out on the, in the committee. But as you say in the, in the recent conversation here, there's going to be the, that segment of society who is enormously uh, enormously affected when they learn that indeed we are not a, a singular society, and there are. Uh, it, that's going to be a, diff a difficult theological barrier for them to overcome. Маленькая шутка. Спросили блондинку, есть ли жизнь во Вселенной помимо жизни на Земле? Она говорит, ну, ответ, 50 на 50. Или есть, или нету. Но абсолютно правда было, после полета Юрия Гагарина в Кремле был очень большой прием. На этом приеме присутствовал патриарх Русской Православной Церкви, ну и, разумеется, глава нашего правительства Никита Сергеевич Хрущев. Когда уже все повеселели и стали смелыми, Никита Сергеевич подходит к Юрию Гагарину и говорит, Юр, ну скажи, ты Бога видел? Ну такой вопрос, он говорит, видел. Юр, я тебя прошу, никому об этом не говори. Прошло какое-то время, подходит его святейшество, патриарх, и очень серьезно начинает его спрашивать. Сын мой, скажи, пожалуйста, ты Бога видел? Он говорит, отец мой, нет, не видел. Сын мой, я тебя прошу, никому об этом не говори. Я... Наша... Страна, великая Россия, страна православия, глубокой веры. И зная историю жизни нашей страны, историю нашего народа, успехи, неудачи, можно иметь представление, какой был народ, какие социальные проблемы были решены, какие не возникали и возникали. И потом, после революции, когда мы все отказались от религии, все стали безбожниками, 
Этих проблем прибавилось столько социальных, что трудно придумать даже. Поэтому я считаю, если народу помогает жить религия, если они верят в это, ради Бога пускай. Пусть те, кто не хочет в это верить, не верят, занимаются наукой, понимают, ведут разъяснительную работу населения. Ну как говорят, религия – опиум народа, как сказал великий Ленин. Ну не пей этот опиум, считай, живи так и считай, как ты считаешь нужным. нужным. Поэтому сейчас в нашей стране, в общем-то, более свободное вероисповедание, никто не притесняет никого, и наши лидеры ходят в церковь и крестятся, и крестятся. Ну и пускай, пускай. А главное, чтобы с детства не забивали голову детям, чтобы с детства дети могли прийти в планетарий. Только там они могут понять, что такое звездное небо. И если в городе нет планетария, считайте, что дети безграмотные. Вот в Москве замечательный планетарий был. Мы там постоянно готовились к своим полетам, изучали звездного неба. Особенно по программе «Луна» когда надо было выполнять автоматические коррекции, ручные коррекции при полете на Луну и обратно. Мы должны были знать и южное, и северное небо. Мы летали даже в Сомали. Наши коллеги летали в Атакаму, в Чили изучали небо, а мы в Сомали изучали небо. Потом планетарий закрыли и ремонтировали 15 лет. Вот в этом году через месяц, наверное, планетарий откроет новый, реставрированный. Значит, 15 лет школьники Москвы, живя в этом гигантском городе, никогда не видели неба. С такое большое освещение они даже не представляют. Начинаешь с ними говорить о звездах, для них это темный лес. И когда я вывез ребенка за город, где нет никакого электрического освещения, он увидел, говорит, дедуль, сколько свечей на небе. И когда ему начинаешь говорить, а ты знаешь, вот большая медведица, смотри, это Дубге, Дубхе, Фегда, Мигрец, Мицар, Алиот, Беннетныш. Он говорит, что это такое? Это внук космонавта. А остальные вообще не знают. Поэтому, если мы хотим образовывать наших детей, надо, чтобы минимум в каждом хотя бы крупном городе был планетарий. Вот тогда ребенок будет понимать и рассуждать, может быть, так, как мы с вами сейчас рассуждаем. Учителя вообще не подготовлены. Больше того, в нашей стране, если раньше мы изучали в школе, был предмет астрономия, Сейчас его нету, этого предмета. И э, я считаю, что это глупость, но не все так считают. Считают, что астрономия – это удел узкого круга людей, и кто захочет быть астрономом, тот поедет в Монголию и в Гоби будет изучать звездное небо. Не так. Поэтому мы хорошо сейчас поговорили. Но чтобы серьезно говорить об обучении детей, начинать хотя бы создание передвижного планетария. Вот в Голландии, я знаю, есть такой, сделали планетарий, который может с одного места приехать в другое, и дети видят. Сейчас мы в этом году создали очень хороший планетарий в Ярославле, в Доме науки и техники имени Терешковой. Центр подготовки космонавтов имеет планетарий где небо, которое видит космонавт, когда он летает, где-то диаметром метров 15, метров 15 купол. Да. И э, приходят к нам школьники, мы даем возможность им заниматься в планетарии. Наблюдая за детьми, мы видим совершенно перерождение мышления человечка маленького. Он 
кто это первый раз увидел. Ему очень интересно, и дальше он хочет. Тогда вероятность появления таких, как вы, будет гораздо больше. Спасибо. Yeah. Oh, pardon. Uh I will just add one more thing to what Alexei Leonov said. Unfortunately, now, about 100% of children in schools in Spain, in other countries, never heard of the name of Yuri Gagarin, or even if they heard of his name or only once, but they do not know. And almost the same number is about Neil Armstrong. So this festival is exactly precise, it's about this. Thanks, Greg. And um, that's taken us up to our 108 minutes. So, yes, George? This is just for Richard. But, you know, you were asking the question about when we, when we find intelligent life on another, you know, extrasolar planet, what kind of impact is it going to have in the world? And the answer is it will have a big impact, the same as the, you know, the Earth and hanging in space. But, in fact, that was only for part of the people. And we have an example that will convince you that this is true. We just had the end of the world happen. <laughs> and, 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 you know, we know the exact date and time when the end of the world was going to happen. There were tremendous broadcasts going on. There were people gathering to see the end of the world. And then there were also religious and psychiatrists there to treat the people who were going to go into the great shock. When, they, when their belief system was failed, and they were not needed at all because the power of the prayer and the, the guidance of the system, all they had to do was slightly modify their worldview to accommodate the fact the world didn't end. You know, people will accommodate in their belief system the fact that there are other intelligent beings in the universe when they have to, right? So <laughs> hopefully there are a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks everybody. This has been a wonderful experience. Thank you, Garrick, for arranging this, and thanks to the, uh, the observatory here for hosting us. It's been fantastic. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Great experience. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs>